Raise your hand if you've ever made a mistake in brewing, or you tasted your beer early in fermentation and thought it was ruined, but decided to ride it out anyway, and it ended up being one of the best beers that you've ever made. Hey, if it's your first time here, I just want to say welcome. Thanks for checking out the channel. Uh, I typically do grain to glass videos where I take a beer all the way from start to finish in a single video, or I'll do shorter, more informative videos and kind of more informal stuff like this one. If you like either of those things, please subscribe and check out my channel page for more content like this. So today we're going to talk about five reasons why your beer is actually probably not ruined. It's probably fine. And why you should follow Charlie Papazian's advice and relax, not worry, and have a home brew. And in case you need something to remind you of these values during a critical moment in brewing, uh, feel free to pick up one of my uh, t-shirts or other merch that you can see down below the description box as a way to support the channel. I really would appreciate it. For real though, we've all been there. Um, I have been there as recently as like two brews ago, uh, where a beer just isn't quite tasting the way you thought it was going to. You're racking your mind and you're like, that's got to be an off flavor. That's got to be an infection. That's got to be something wrong with the beer. It's obviously ruined. There's no reason, I can, there's nothing I can do to save it, um, but I probably will just let it wait and sit. Well, in nine times out of 10, time is what heals a beer. But if you're curious about what those off flavors taste like and why they happen, I highly recommend you actually go check out Trent at The Brew Show. He has a video, which I'm gonna link right here in the corner. His off flavors video is probably one of the best resources that you can get for that particular thing. I highly recommend checking out his video. It's very well made, as are all of the other videos on his channel. Uh, definitely go check him out, subscribe to him, and watch all of his videos at the same time. So let's start with probably what is the common culprit for most of us and definitely the common culprit for me, and that is a young beer doesn't necessarily taste the way that I thought it was going to. Uh, therefore, something must have gone wrong. I must have made a mistake somewhere, and uh, it's clearly ruined. I specifically made this mistake uh, not once, but twice over the last year. The first one was a Russian Imperial Stout that I brewed last year. Now, in that video, I said it was infected because it tasted like sour cherries and I uh, was continuing to build pressure in the keg. Well, it turns out it wasn't actually infected. Um, the issue was that even though it sat for three months, it needed to sit for another three on top of that before it would actually start tasting really good. Um, and unfortunately I jumped the gun because I wanted to get the video out and because I thought the beer was done for. But thank God I didn't dump it because it actually ended up being really tasty. It's just that Russian Imperial Stouts just don't really work that well in the summer. Uh, so I ended up actually bottling off a bunch of it and letting it sit in the fridge. We're going to probably hold on to some of those and crack them open a little bit later this year when it starts to get colder. Sample number two is the Belgian Double that I recently made. And I was all super critical of the fact that I had no head retention on it because, you know, it didn't in the video. But I gave it another three weeks of aging and it turns out that thing has a nice fluffy head now. And who knew? It just unsurprisingly needed a little more time. Right now I have a German Pilsner that's not quite lagered out yet. And it doesn't quite taste like a German Pilsner in my mind. And the reason why is it just hasn't had enough time to lager. Be patient with your beers. They will almost always get better, unless they're a hoppy beer and they've been exposed to oxygen, in which case it will not get better. But nine times out of 10, time heals all wounds. Give your beer enough time to condition out, actually be patient with it. And unlike me, you'll actually end up cracking open your first pour of it and enjoying that beer instead of waiting until your last pour of it to actually enjoy it. Reason number two is holy crap, you forgot to sanitize something that you weren't touched. Your beer is obviously going to get infected and you should just dump it now to avoid the headache later on down the road. Believe it or not, wort and yeast, in fact, are a little bit more robust than you might think. Um, while this is not a problem that home brewers should really experience very frequently, as sanitation is incredibly important, and this should not be misconstrued as me saying that you could be lax with sanitation, and nothing could be further from the truth, all of us at some point in time have forgotten to sanitize something important and have probably been biting our nails waiting for the beer to ferment and see whether or not there was an issue with it. But the reality is most of the time yeast is actually the dominant microorganism in that small ecosystem that is your fermenter. And it will, most times while it is active, kill off everything else. Um, and if you're worried about a lactobacillus infection, very few strains of lacto can actually survive uh, 
anything over about 15 IBUs worth of hopping, which is most beers. So unless you're grossly negligent in your sanitation practices, it's very unlikely that you have an infection in your system. But that doesn't mean at all that you shouldn't clean. I'm gonna say it twice because it needs to be said twice. Sanitation is incredibly important and you really should be putting 110% effort into making sure your equipment is clean and sanitized. Uh, but if at some point during the process you forgot to do something and you might have you know, run your beer through an unsanitized filter, or you might have used an unsanitized brew spoon to stir up your whirlpool, or you forgot to sanitize a hose that your beer went through. For short contact things like that, it's not a very high risk, uh, but let's say you forgot to sanitize your fermenter. Let's say you forgot to sanitize your keg. Anything your beer is gonna be sitting in for more than a minute or two is probably going to have uh, some sanitation risks associated with it if you forgot to do that. Even though in that one video I said the Russian Imperial Stout was infected, it ended up not being infected, um, I have yet to get an infection, knock on wood, uh, in, my, in my brew house. Uh, and the reason for that is because I just take sanitation seriously. You don't necessarily need to be an absolute sanitation fanatic, but it does definitely help to be diligent and um, as thorough as possible when you're sanitizing your equipment. But if you forgot to sanitize one little thing at one point in time, you're probably gonna be fine, just don't make it a habit. Number three is aimed at my New England IPA crowd here, um, and that is, oh no, I opened the fermenter for more than a microsecond and now my beer is completely oxidized and it's gonna be terrible. Oxidation is a serious issue. It is a serious risk when you're brewing any sort of hoppy beer, but in, for most beers in general, you want to avoid contact with oxygen after primary fermentation is done. Otherwise, yes, it does spoil the beer. Uh, it does shorten its shelf life, right? However, there's a number of steps that we could take to cut down on the amount of oxidation risk that you might have. That's like adding ascorbic acid to help scrub oxygen, doing close transfers between your fermenter and your serving vessel, your keg, flushing out the headspace of any bottles with CO2 or making sure that there is always CO2 in your fermenter if you want to open it up. Um, these are important things to help preserve beer shelf life. However, if at some point in time you open your fermenter throw something in it, close your fermenter, you're probably gonna be fine. For the most part, that doesn't really affect beer's oxygen levels at all. Uh, what does affect the beer's oxygen level is opening the fermenter for like a minute at a time, staring at your beer, taking a hydrometer sample, throwing some dry hops in, and weaving the lid off for at least a minute. That is where you start to really risk oxygen exposure, and that's a problem. This is a little bit of a debated topic in the homebrew community, but there's a thing called the CO2 blanket, which may or may not exist. But the thinking goes that CO2 is heavier than air. As a result, CO2 tends to sink down uh, and blanket the surface of the wort with a protective layer of CO2 so that when you open the fermenter, uh, the oxygen does not actually make it into your beer and is buffered out by the CO2. That may be true, uh, that may also not be true, because when you open a fermenter, you do create a small vacuum and that sucks CO2 out of the fermenter. But if it is true, you shouldn't have too much to worry about if you happen to open your fermenter for a few seconds and you know add some dry hops. The real risk for oxidation comes in transferring, so if you happen to use an open bottling bucket or you open your fermenter to siphon the beer out from the top, you are absolutely exposing it to oxygen, as well as introducing any sort of splashing, dissolving oxygen in there. Uh, dry hopping can actually drag oxygen into a beer as well, so just be careful with that. But if you are moderately careful in your brewing practices to avoid oxidation, and you add something like ascorbic acid to scrub all the excess oxygen out of the fermenter, or you just do all your dry hopping and fermenter opening during the primary phase of fermentation where yeast is actively making CO2, you're gonna be fine. And it's not much to worry about. Number four, this one's for my brew house efficiency nerds. Uh, basically, you didn't hit your numbers. Your beer was either way lower or way higher than your target gravity, and ah, uh, the beer is ruined. It's not gonna be the same thing you designed. Boo-hoo, it's not gonna be the same beer, no but it might not be a bad beer. Let me preface this by saying that I don't really care about brew house efficiency that much. Obviously I'm not turning a profit and I'm not really obsessed with getting every ounce of 
efficiency out of the grain that I possibly can. I was brewing in a system last year that was like 50 something percent efficiency and I just needed to add a little more grain to make up for the efficiency losses. It's not a very difficult problem to solve and I don't think it's really worth losing sleep over. But that's just my opinion. Uh, there's a lot of people who definitely disagree with that think otherwise and that is absolutely fine. But let's look at what happens say, let's say your gravity is, is low. Right, you're not gonna end up with as much sugar in your beer. The only situation where I can think of that being a serious issue is if you put a double IPA's worth of hops into a beer that came out with a less than 1050 gravity, you might have pretty unpleasant beer to drink if that was the case, because um, you do need a little alcohol, you do need a little sweetness to balance out those hops, right? Your beer might risk being unbalanced, but that doesn't necessarily mean it will be a bad beer. So I just encourage you to go ahead, ferment it out, see how it is, if it's too bitter or too strong of a beer than what you had designed, give it some time to mellow out. It might actually surprise you as to how good it tastes a couple months down the road. The last one is a, one that I get a lot in comments or Instagram messages, and people are just worried that their fermentation is, is not working. Uh, they're worried the fermentation either stuck or the yeast was dead uh, because their airlock's not bubbling. The reality is just because your airlock's not bubbling does not mean that your yeasts are not working. I think it's one of the most common things people are worried about um, because it's obviously a very direct correlation to fermentation activity. Different yeast strains ferment at different levels of intensity. So if you have a Hefeweizen strain, for example, um, and you pitch that into a wort, it's going to ferment extremely intensely. There is going to be a lot of off gas. There's going to be a ton of uh, CO2 that is being pushed out of that beer and your airlock's going to go crazy and it might actually require a blow off too because of the intensity of the fermentation. Now, I flip that on its head and say you brew a, a low gravity lager. So you're going to be pitching a yeast that is not an intense fermenter. It's fermenting at a cooler temperature and therefore not as intensely and it's low gravity so it's not going to be reproducing like crazy you're not gonna get much airlock activity at all. However, your yeast is absolutely doing exactly what it needs to be doing. So while it may be difficult to tell based on your airlock whether there's activity in your fermenter, you know what doesn't lie is a hydrometer. So don't be afraid to take hydrometer samples during your fermentation to get an idea of how it's going. And the rule of thumb is if you reach a consistent hydrometer reading about three days in a row, your fermentation is probably done. If you're like plus or minus three or four gravity points from the end of your fermentation, you've got less than a week left before it's really done. Understand, however, that fermentation is a decaying exponential curve, right? So you're gonna have a lot of fermentation at the very beginning. It's going to ferment a decent amount of sugars very quickly, and then it's gonna to start to slow down, and it's gonna take a lot longer to finish out the second half of fermentation. You might see a lot of airlock activity in that first half, however, the second part might not actually push a significant amount of bubbles out of the airlock, okay? So even though you might not have airlock activity, that second piece of fermentation is still happening. And then on top of that, you also have a conditioning period where your yeast are not fermenting sugar anymore or producing any more alcohol, but they are getting rid of off flavors. They're cleaning up some of the byproducts that they created during fermentation, and that's not gonna make any airlock activity either. This is one of the reasons why there is that old adage of every fermentation takes two weeks, uh, because even though your fermentation theoretically is probably done in seven to 10 days, your yeast still needs a lot of time to finish up the last little bits and make your beer taste a little bit better. It's one of the reasons why uh, in some styles of beer, it's advised that you don't package too early because you might actually cut off the uh, fermentation uh, before it's actually completed. And that leaves you with some unpleasant flavors in your beer potentially. But basically, even if you don't see airlock activity at all, just take a hydrometer reading and figure out if anything's changed. I have actually had an instance where I pitched a bad packet of yeast. Um, the fermentation didn't happen uh, for a week and I was worried about it. I took a hydrometer sample and that confirmed what I was worried about. So I pitched new yeast, the beer fermented and turned out fine. Sometimes you won't see very much airlock activity or it'll take a long time to get started. But just be patient, let the yeast do its thing and don't mess with it and it'll probably be fine. What is it I keep saying during this video? Nine times out of 10, time heals everything. So TLDR, time fixes everything. Your beer is probably not ruined, so you shouldn't mess with it. And at the end of the day, all you have to do is follow the Charlie Papazian values. Relax, don't worry, and have a homebrew. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. If you did enjoy it and you learned something, hit that like button. 
If you like the content, please subscribe. If you want to support this channel, I have a variety of links in the description box which help my channel out if you're interested in buying any homebrewing gear. And if you also want to check out some of my t-shirt lineup, please go ahead and check out the merch store that's down below the description box as well. Uh, if you're interested in giving on a more personal level, I have a Patreon account as well. And if you're interested in following me on social media besides YouTube, I'm on Instagram and Instagram only as The Apartment Brewer. Thank you for watching, guys. I really do hope you enjoyed it and found things useful. If you made it this far to the end of the video, you are really a true fan, and I thank you very much for doing what you're doing right now and watching all the way. Anyway, I will catch you guys in the next one. So until then, cheers.